morning. I'm Dr. Casey Bundock, and I'm the director for the Center for Professional Development of Teachers for Urban Ed. I want to say a very big welcome to our PD1 students who are joining us for the first time. And PD2, welcome back. So PD1, you can see that PD2 survived. They made it through last night. So all the rumors that you've heard are not true. You're going to make it, and you're going to do a fantastic job. All right. What I'd like for us to do this morning is spend some time together in a general session where I'll give a general overview of some procedures and expectations that you will be expected to be a part of this semester. So PD2, a lot of this is going to sound familiar. It's a good review, but we do have some new things for you to consider. We do have some changes. So stay focused with us. Uh, we want to make sure that you're getting all of the information you need. PD1, I want to let you know you're going to be getting a lot of information today. It's okay that you don't absorb this all this morning because please know that your faculty members and your FBIs are going to be supporting you in this journey. So this is just the first time you'll hear this information. So you'll take what you can away from the session this morning and we'll go forward and continue to support you with this information throughout the semester. So this morning what we hope to do on our agenda is to go through a general orientation session going through our handbook that you can find online very easily. And I'm going to hit some of those high points for you to recognize some of the larger components of our program. I'm also going to talk to you about what we call our diagnostic experiences. Some of the faculty have already mentioned the importance of your certification tests. And we want to talk about one way that we support you in that and how we're just really going to get the ball rolling very soon here in the next few weeks in helping to support you with that testing. I also want to give you just a brief snapshot of a possibility um, if you're if you have financial aid, if you have loans, some possibilities for you after you graduate. And we also have several members from student organizations here this morning to talk to you about their organizations and invite you to join them. So why don't we start off and talk a little bit about um, our goal for our department. So we are a state-approved center for professional development of teachers, and really our goal is to work with students that are in urban settings or at-risk settings. So as all of you go out to work with mentors this semester, you will be at a, either an urban school or a school that's a Title I or an at-risk campus to really support this goal. And those districts that are supporting us in PD1 and 2 semesters are noted there. When you go on to PD3, we have some additional partnerships in other districts that you may choose to work with. But for this semester, our partnerships for PD1 and 2 are noted here. We want to recognize that our standards are based on the TEKS, the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, and that is, forms the basis for your Texas exams, your certification exams that you'll be taking at the end of the, each of your PD semesters. So our standards are measured by your PPR exam. Those of you in PD1, you'll be taking your PPR at the end of this semester. Those of you in PD2 are going to be looking forward to taking your content exam in your specified certification area at the end of the semester. So by the time you get to PD3, all of your exams are finished and you're ready to focus your attention on student teaching and getting that job that you've been hoping for. Let's talk a little bit about the features of PD1 and 2. This is very generally speaking. And as you meet with your faculty members, they'll offer you much more specific information about their courses. So in PD1, we really focus on understanding the learner. So for our e EC through 6 generalist, bilingual generalist, and 4 through 8 generalist, we look a lot at understanding the learner and also that content methodology. And our 7 through 12, our secondary program, we're looking at the same thing as well as classroom environment and professional roles. As we move into PD2, we slightly shift in our focus to enhancing student achievement. So with EC through 6 and 4 through 8 certifications, we're looking at that content methodology more closely. And for our secondary folks in PD2, we're looking at literacy, instructional design, and assessment. So this is in consideration of your academic courses. But for all of these certification areas, you also have an additional course, a field experience course. So when you enroll in that course, you'll also have 60 hours of field work that you're completing, which averages out to about six hours per week over the course of 10 weeks. So you can look forward to having your academic classes and also having time in the field with a mentor. And you'll be able to observe there and work with that mentor teacher and also teach some lessons, uh, which will be observed by a university supervisor. One of the things that I'm going to be doing today is highlighting some components of our UHD PD handbook. 
And I want to make you aware of these things because if you're just coming into PD-1, you may not be aware of some of our criteria. If you're in PD-2, this is a great reminder of what our goals and expectations are in the program. After this general session with me, you'll have a chance to meet with your FEI. And at that time, your FEI is going to ask you to acknowledge that we took a look at some of these parts of the handbook. So this is one of the things that we're going to take a look at, recognizing this is a portion of our handbook. And that's the academic criteria for PD-1 and 2. So academically, when you're in the professional development semesters, you must maintain at least a 2.5 GPA. When you take all of your PD courses, those courses, you must make at least a C or better in those courses. If a C is not earned, then you must retake those courses. So that is one of the academic criteria that you'll certainly want to keep in mind for PD 1 and 2. Um, we want to recognize that there's a lot of opportunity for you to read about this if you want to take a look more closely at these academic criteria. So this is noted on your degree plan that you need to see or better in these courses. It's noted on the handbook online, and it's also noted in the catalog. So please know that there's opportunity for you to take a closer look at this with all of this different documentation. Also, some of the academic criteria concerned for PD 1 and 2 recognizes your participation, preparedness, and professionalism. So before, in your pre-PD classes, you're viewed as students, but now you're viewed as teacher candidates. So we really look to you as professionals at this point, and we want to recognize the professionalism that you can show, not only out in the field with your mentor, but also in the classroom now, that you are really taking a step up and you're a teacher candidate now. We also want to recognize this last bullet point, and that is that at this point in your academic career, it is imperative that you're working to communicate effectively. So that means you're communicating clearly, effectively, and professionally at all times. That means when you're talking to one another in class, if you're speaking with a faculty member, if you're working with a mentor on campus, you might be speaking with an administrator on campus. It could be a phone conversation, it could be an email. At all times, we're considering ourselves professionals in the interactions that we have. We want to make sure that we're communicating effectively and clearly. So this is jumping up a step from moving away from being a student to being a teacher candidate. So that was the academic criteria. We also have professional criteria since we're considering you as a teacher candidate now. So first of all, we want to recognize that you're going to be adhering to what we call the teacher candidate criteria for field work component. And I've noted a page number there in the handbook if you want to make note of that. This is also something that your FEI might talk to you about today in the breakout session or if not very soon in another meeting that you'll have with him or her. What we want to recognize is not only do you get grades for your academic courses in PD, but you also receive grades from your FEIs for the work that you do in the field. You receive satisfactory or unsatisfactory ratings. So this rating scale takes a look at important things that you're doing in the field. Are you following the guidelines that your mentor gives you? Are you creating thorough, detailed lesson plans? Are you teaching to be objective on your lesson plans? So there are several criteria in which you'll be engaged to show that you're making satisfactory, satisfactory progress while you're out in the field. The second item here knows the code of ethics and standard practices for teacher education. So this is found at the end of the handbook. And this is guided by TEA, or the Texas Education Agency. And it's really offering some ethical guidelines that we follow in our profession. Finally, we have professional attributes for teacher candidates. And these are things that we're going to be looking for, attributes that you demonstrate in the field with your professionalism. So this is another document your FBI will be taking a look at with you before you're going out into the field, recognizing these are ways that you can demonstrate your professionalism in the field. So we have both academic and professional criteria in PD 1 and 2. I also want us to recognize that we have several different district partnerships, and all of our district partnerships, before we can, are allowed to go out onto campus, we're asked to fill out background checks. So please know that's a standard procedure. So as you meet with your FEI today, they're going to ask you to either complete an online background check over the course of the next week, and they'll offer directions for that, or they may ask you to fill out a paper copy of a background check before you leave today. They'll submit that to me, and I will give that to our district HR contact. So please know this is standard practice for anybody that's wanting to be able to go and work in the schools. I want to pause for just a minute and let Dean Van Horn uh, come in and just say hello and welcome you to PD Orientation. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here with all of you. 
I know that you are very, very much excited, just like I am. This, for some of you, is the very first time you'll actually go into a school and see what it is you're going to be doing. It's a really ugly day outside, but it's beautiful in here because you're beginning. Oh, I'm so excited to see you. <laughs> and I know you are too. But I think one of the tip-top things that we need to remember during an internship experience is to stay together with each other and to stay together with all of us. In other words, we're here for you. We want to support you. We want to hear about the great days. We want to hear about the times when you need us to encourage you because that's why you came to this program, for that kind of support. Develop that with each other. Be honest, share, you know, talk. That's always the best thing, I think. And know that every day you're out there, people in the schools are with you. They're watching you. They're looking for, for the next, their next new partner in education, and that will be you. Wow, I'm looking around the room and I just know all of you. <laughs> it's so exciting, so exciting. So exciting. Um, when you come in for the meetings and things, you know that you know where my office is and you know the glass area and then we're gonna we have quite a few tables and, and chairs out there and I've noticed people working out there and I love that because it gives us a chance to just visit and see how it's going. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. Bundock, for letting me welcome everybody. Could go on, but I think I'm kind of So, so I'll be thinking about it. Good luck! Wow! Yay! Thank you, Dean Vanport. All right. Another one of the things that your FBI is going to ask you to acknowledge that you heard about this morning in the orientation presentation is program completion and certification requirements. So you might feel like, wow, that seems a little while down the line. I'm not ready for PD3. I'm not completing my program. But I want to acknowledge we understand what our goals and expectations are for right now. And we need to know what needs to happen in order to finish the program as well. So let's take a look at these goals and recommendations for you all to complete your program. You're going to continue with your 2.5 GPA. You're going to complete all of your course requirements. Uh, and in student teaching, you still do have one additional course that you take with your student teaching. You're going to continue to work on that field work. You still have those criteria to complete field work successfully. You're also going to continue with your professionalism, and you're going to be taking a look at our academic and professional policy. As mentioned earlier, you certainly want to pass your certification exams before you graduate. Um, and that means that for all of you, you're going to pass your PPR, you're going to pass your content exam, and if you're a bilingual candidate, you'll also be passing the BTLPT. We want to recognize you won't have any holds or fees that are owed at that time. You won't be on academic probation, certainly not, because you have your 2.5 GPA. And these are some things that are going to be coming up at the very, very end, right before you graduate. You're going to apply for recommendation on the TEAL website. You're going to submit a recommendation request to the department to, to clear you for that, and you're going to earn your degree. Ms. Hanna does a fantastic job of working with our PD3 candidates and guiding them through that process and letting them know what they need. So this is just planting the seed with you that later on, several of us will be working with you to help you wrap up your program. So know that we recognize our expectations now and there are additional expectations as you finish up your program in PD3. All right, I want to talk to you now about the diagnostic experience. PD2, you guys have been there, done that. There are some changes though, so I want to make you aware of those changes. PD1, we've talked a bit about these certification exams, and our department wants to make sure that we're supporting you as you go forward and take these exams. So of course your faculty member in your courses are working with you in the content methodology that you need to know to pass your exams, but we also want to support you in understanding what the actual exam looks like and what the exam setting will look like. So we do that through a series of what we call the diagnostic experiences. So we have three goals here. We want to help you understand your strengths and weaknesses because you know once you take an exam and you get your score back, you can see what you did well at and what you still need to work on. So that's what we're going to do. We also want you to practice your test taking skills. So we will sort of mirror what uh, the Texas exam looks like in terms of how it's proctored, uh, what the exam looks like, and the amount of time you have to take that exam. This is also going to inform your professor's instruction. So once your professors get the results back from your exams, we're better able to say, oh, these are some things I really need to focus on in class, and these are some other things that they seem to already know. 
So we'll be able to focus our attention on what you need in our courses. So let's talk a little bit about what the test day will look like, what you can bring and not bring, and then we'll talk about those specific exams. So I'm just going to speak generally about the day of the test, and then we'll sort of work backwards. So when you go to take this diagnostic experience, since you all have downtown classes, I think most of you all will be taking your exam here in the one main building you'll go to testing services. When you go in to take the real certification exam, the only thing you can bring in is your ID and your admission ticket. So when you come to our practice exam, that's all you bring in, your ID and your admission ticket. We want to mimic or mirror this experience for you. So that's noted here. What to bring on the test day? You're going to bring a printed admission ticket. So when it's time to take this exam, testing services is going to send you an email through Gator Mail. You should check your Gator Mail frequently. Mm -hmm. Some of you are thinking, I don't know that I've ever logged into Gator Mail. And that's okay. Now's the time to start. I want to encourage you to check Gator Mail at least every other day because people like me, people like Miss Hannah, people like advising, people like testing services, we only have your Gator Mail. So please, please check frequently. And if not, have it forwarded to whatever your regular email account is. So you'll receive an admission ticket. You'll need to print it and bring a printed copy. You will not be able to show your phone and say, here it is. You will not be able to bring a phone into the testing session. So do print a ticket and save that email. You will also need a, an ID. Usually what this looks like is your Texas driver's license. And because the Texas exam says you must have a non-damaged, non-expired Texas driver's license, that's what we require. So you need a non-damaged, non-expired, government-issued form of ID. If that seems like it's going to be a problem, if you're thinking in your mind right now, okay, my driver's license is expired, I need you to email me and you can be in contact and work something out. Another thing that's a big issue, ladies, if you're recently married and you haven't changed your name on your UHD documents, that's problematic because when you get your admission ticket, it's going to say whatever name it is that you have, you're enrolled with, with in the university. And if your driver's license is different, they're not going to admit you into the testing session. So I need you to contact me before the exam and we're going to work that out. And I'm going to request that by the end of the semester, your records match, whatever your Texas driver's license says. So be looking for my email through Gator Mail saying, if your names do not match, I need you to contact me and we need to work this out. So on the day of the test, you're just bringing in your admission ticket your government-issued ID, you're also bringing sharpened pencils. This is going to be a, a Scantron test, so you want to be able to bring in your pencils. I've listed below this everything else you cannot bring in. It's everything else, guys. So if it's not an ID or an admission ticket or pencils, then don't bring it. So that's, you know, calculators, notes, all of that good stuff, beverages, drinks, food. Don't bring it. And there's nowhere to store it. So please don't think, oh, I can just bring a backpack in and they can keep it at the desk. There's not a place to store it. One of the things that testing services told me when I met with them the other day is sometimes students think that because they've taken other exams and testing services that they can bring belongings in. And that's true for other tests, but not for this test. So please know that this is a different kind of test and they will not allow belongings in because on the real Texas exam, they do not allow belongings. All right, I want to let you know about some other important notes about the diagnostic exam. This is a, a fee that is outside of your regular diagnostic, of, of your regular fee bill. So you'll be billed $40 outside of your, uh, outside of your regular expenses for the semester. So what I want you to recognize here is, this is something that will be billed to you at the beginning of the semester that you'll need to pay by the end of the semester. So look for that on your bill and know that you'll need to pay before the semester is over. I want us to recognize that um, admission tickets will be sent to your Gator Mail and that if you're looking at the time and place for your, uh, if you're looking at the time and place of your admission ticket and that seems like something you can't do, then we're gonna have you request by January 28th that you make those requested changes. 
Okay, so I am by no means going to be as strong as Dr. Bundock. She yeah. does an excellent job at this. Um, but I'm familiar with the information, so you'll see me read the slide and then give the information back to you. Okay, so as she was stating, um, you'll be billed the $40. Just check, okay? So make sure that you kind of check throughout the semester. If you haven't seen it billed there, okay, then say, okay, I know this, it's going to be on, it's going to come on there at some point in the semester to make sure that you pay for it before you get to the end, end of the semester so you don't have anything like an outstanding fee or anything like that on, the, on your uh, bill. <clears throat> so let's see here. So it says around the 28th of January, if you need, so you will be assigned a day to come and take the exam, and that goes along with the location that you um, choose to take the exam. And as Dr. Bundock was stating, the majority of you probably will take the exam here in testing services, which is in the main building. But for those of you who might live um, closer to Northwest, you might also choose to take the exam there. But you'll have those options. Um, and then you'll be assigned a date. If for anything you say, wait, I am not going to be in town, um, something happens, to them, you already have something scheduled, then you would contact Mandy Estrada in testing services to mention why you cannot make that and then they um, will try and reschedule with you. So um, the dates for uh, the exam would be either the 30th or the 31st of this month, so the very end of the month. And for our, for PD1, you take the PPR exam. And for our PD2 students, you'll be taking the appropriate content exam, okay? Um, if you are ACP, it's reversed. So our ACP students actually take their content exam first. So if you're PD1 ACP, you'll take your content exam. And if you're PD2 ACP, then you will take the PPR. And that just goes with along with the hiring. Um, so we have the pre-diagnostic, and then we get the results. You get the results. As professors, we look at it and say, okay, just like Dr. Bondak was saying, they're strong in these areas, so we'll just review this a little bit. I see that the majority of my class, or there are some weaker points, some weaker uh, competencies. Um, we're going to work on those a little bit more in the appropriate classes. Then, throughout the semester, you're learning more information, and we will have a post-diagnostic. And so the dates for the post-diagnostic are April 10th or 11th. Okay. And so just kind of look at your schedules right now and know, you know what, I'm going to have to take an exam on one of those days. When you receive information from um, testing services regarding the day of pre-diagnostic, they'll also give you the post-diagnostic date. So you'll know um, before, you know, in, a, in the next couple of weeks probably, um, the date for your pre-diagnostic as well as the date for your post-diagnostic. So you can go on and say, oh, I'm going to be out of town, I have to be at a wedding, whatever's going to happen, that you might need to contact um, Ms. Estrada to um, ask for a different testing date. Okay. All right, so what we have established, so that we, we get an idea of how, and you all will also get an idea of your areas of strength, your areas of weaknesses, where you would want to concentrate most of your uh, studying. Um, we've implemented the, if you see it, the, the first bullet, um, at, we're asking our students to try and make it 80% or higher. Okay? Now on the pre-diagnostic, the pre-diagnostic is just that. Okay? What we want you to do is get an idea, it's like a benchmark, what, what they use in the elementary school or what they use in uh, K-12. So you get an idea of where you are on the pre-diagnostic. Okay? Keep in mind, some of this information you haven't even learned yet, right? So it's just an idea. So if you do not receive the 80% on that pre-diagnostic, don't worry. Use it as a benchmark and say, okay, now I know which areas I need to study and I'm going to move forward. Throughout the semester, again, you're learning additional information. So, of course, you're, we should see your scores raise a little bit, okay? Um, okay, so we have some different opportunities for you all as you're testing. If you make that 80% on the pre-diagnostic, then you have the option to take the post-diagnostic or not. We encourage you to go ahead and take the post-diagnostic because it's an extra added bonus um, that you get to experience the test another time before you take the actual exam. But you can opt not to take it. That's, that's up to you. That's your choice. Um, if you do, and then if you want to go ahead and take the post-diagnostic, we're going to also take a look at that post-diagnostic score. So if you don't score an 80% or higher on the post-diagnostic, we still want to make sure that you're feeling prepared before you take that exam. So there's a couple of options with that as all. also. We have a, what we offer is a free online review session called the T-CERT review. So you can 
take that review online and submit that before you're cleared to test, just to make sure you have one more opportunity to review for the exam. You'll also be invited to review sessions here on campus that are free that are offered by the faculty members. So we want to make sure before you take your actual exam that you're feeling very prepared and confident about that opportunity. So we want to help to support you with that throughout the semester. So, what we want to recognize now with this slide is the timeline that will be followed with your testing. So, PD1 teacher candidates, you all are eligible to take the PPR after the semester. PD2 candidates, you're going to be taking the content exam this semester. And what we're going to do, PD2, you may have heard that the content exam format is changing. And we want you to be eligible to take that content exam before the format changes. So we're going to allow you to take that exam during the semester while you're in PD2 instead of waiting until the very end. So during the semester, your faculty members will give you more information about how that will be handled. But know that you'll have the opportunity to move on that option during the semester. We want to recognize that in order to be approved to take these exams, there's certain criteria that you'll need. And again, your faculty and Ms. Hannah will let you know what those criteria are. Please know that as you're getting to the end of the semester and you're planning to take your exams, right now the current fee for each test is $120. So start thinking now, that's a lot of money to pay for a test. How am I going to pay for that? Can I budget a little bit each month? So you're planning ahead so at the end of the semester you're not stuck with this test bill that you're not able to pay. So really plan ahead and make sure that that's something that's in your plan. We want to make sure all of this happens for you because it gives you an opportunity to be successful in taking your Texas exams after completing the related coursework. Uh, and it also gives you the opportunity to pass all of your exams before student teaching, which is our ultimate goal here. All right, I very briefly want to touch on a new topic. But before I go on, I want to recognize that's a lot of information about diagnostic and Texas exams. And if it's new to you, you're probably feeling a little bit hazy on how this looks. Please know that throughout the semester, your faculty will be talking to you about these exams. And I'll also be sending you a number of email so that you can get prepared for the diagnostic experiences and the actual Texas exams. So this is just a brief introduction. Don't feel like you have to know everything all at once. It's just an introduction for you. I want to note very briefly about <laughs> teacher loan forgiveness. I'm not an expert in this area at all, so I do want to give you a contact for this once we're done addressing this. Many of you may have loans, you may have financial aid, and you may be concerned about, as you're nearing the end of your degree, how it is that you'll be paying this back. So I want to let you know that there's something called loan forgiveness for teachers. So. What this looks like is if you were to go after you graduate and work in a public school, in an independent school district, at a Title I or an at-risk campus, if you do that for five consecutive years, you are eligible for loan forgiveness. And what loan forgiveness looks like for most of your certification areas is that would be $5,000 of your loan would be forgiven if you were five consecutive years at an at-risk campus in Texas. If you went on to receive perhaps an, another degree, some of you may be in a, in a, high, in a, um, a math or science teacher or usually special education also, those are content areas where there's a high need or a high demand for teacher candidates. Those candidates may receive up to $17,500 of loan forgiveness for those content areas. So please know that this is an option if you're concerned about what's going to happen after you graduate and paying those loan backs, please know that loan forgiveness is an option. There's a contact number at the bottom here, a contact email, pardon me, for Megan Lane, and it's her maiden name, benedetti.uhd.edu. <coughs> if you think this is something you'd be interested in learning more about, please contact Megan, and she would be happy to tell you how this will look when you're ready for graduation. All right, at this time, we're going to step back from some of the serious um, overview of the semester. And I would like to invite four of our different student organizations to come to speak with you. They're going to tell you a little bit about their organizations, 
and invite you to join and let you know how that might happen. So I'd like to first invite UELS and those representatives to come. <laughs> Good morning. I'm so I really am happy to look around and see so many friends or people that are already members and organizations with us or just people I've had classes with that I haven't seen in a while. So I am Lauren Thomas and I am the Vice President of the Urban Educators Literacy Society. Most of you know it as UELS and this is... I'm Chris Perez. I'm the Recruiting Officer. So we're just going to talk to you um, very briefly about the organization. So um, Basically, UELS is an organization whose mission is to provide experience for pre-service teachers, for you all to acquire knowledge, um, serve the community, and develop professional contacts with each other, sponsors, or people that you meet at events, workshops, and um, conferences. So as a member um, of the Urban Educators Literacy Society, we host family literacy nights, like I said, attend literacy conferences, seminars, and many events that all celebrate literacy in all forms. So um, we hope that you all will choose to join us. It's very exciting. Um, we serve the community in many ways. Um, if you join, we have incentive programs. You do receive cords. If you're graduating and you are considered an active member, um, we have a lot of networking opportunities. This semester, we'll be working with other organizations um, Dr. Bendock mentioned the PPR exams and the content exams that we all will be taking. We're going to offer um, study sessions for that, so that will be a great opportunity for you all. And our sponsors are Dr. Dalton and um, Dr. Pinkerton. Some of you may have had them in classes or even in your PDs. And if you are interested, we will be outside after, after orientation here. We'll have our membership forms. We have a PowerPoint we'd like to show you um, with our members actually working in the community, what we're about. We'll go more into detail about everything. If you can't stay but would still like to receive some information, we have two meetings the first week of school. The first one is January 21st. That's a Wednesday. It'll be here in C100, and that's going to be an evening meeting at 430. And then Thursday, the following day, we'll also be here in C100. And we have two opportunities for you to join us at 12 noon and then 4.30 again. So I would love to see you all and hope to see you in not only UELS, but just out working in the field. I'm really excited for everyone. So please join us. Next, I believe we have some KDP representatives here. Okay, Dr. Burnett is our KDP <laughs> representative. So I'd like to invite her uh, to tell you more about this organization. I dabbled in a little bit of everything. <laughs> um, okay, so and, and myself as well as Dr. Cole, we're both the um, sponsors and right now our president, vice president are both PD3, so they're out in the classrooms right now and so that's one reason they weren't able to come. Um, but KDP, Kappa Delta Pi, is an international honor society, um, so we are looking for you to have um, higher grades, a 3.0 cumulative GPA as one of the requirements to um, join the organization. I'll tell you that the deadline to join this semester would be um, February 9th, which should be the second Monday in February. Um, if you go online to our web, to uh, the Urban, Edu uh, sorry, the Department of Urban Education's homepage, on the left hand side, you're going to see, you know, different tabs and one says student organizations. And so you'll also find a little blur about each of the student organizations that will speak here. Um, but for ours in particular, there's an online application that you can fill out. So you would just click on student orgs, you'll scroll down, you'll see Capital to Pi online app and you fill it there. Uh, you'll fill the online application there. If you're not sure about your GPA, go on and fill in the application and we'll let you know because we do respond to you in about two weeks because we have to check the GPA and everything. Um, the purpose of our organization is really to kind of get people who are interested in education together. Um, as a member of KDP, uh, there are different benefits, there are scholarships that you can apply for that are, are through, it's not through our specific chapter, but it's through the national organization. So they have several different scholarships for students and, and um, active teachers and such at different levels. So from undergraduate through doctorate, student <coughs> teachers through teaching, through uh, master teachers, there's different um, scholarships there. Some of the things that we were doing um, 
last semester, so I'll highlight some of the events that they had last semester. They did a book drive to help support uh, Crockett Elementary, which is not too far from here. Um, so perhaps you saw the little boxes sort of at the end of the semester where, you know, you might have donated a book or so. Um, so they had a book drive. We collaborated with the um, Spanish National Honor Society, and we had a Spanish spelling bee, and that was cute. It was fun. If you ever see little kids, they get super excited about you know spelling their words, and one little boy was like really nervous. He started like crossing himself, and everything was <laughs> ah, <laughs> okay. I want to win. Um, but but we had fun, and the kids had fun as well. Um, and. Oh, Literacy Alive event. So one of the things that Kappa Delta Pi does is try to um, get the chapters in our chapters of Omega Phi, the chapters to promote literacy, promote education in different. And again, we worked with, um, we did work with Crockett Elementary. But one thing that we would like for our students and our members to do is give us suggestions, okay, on different activities that you can do, the things that you might be interested in or maybe you already have a connection. Um, because as long as it's working with children, working with education, all of those types of um, service opportunities are something that we could participate in. Um, and just to, re to go over the minimum requirements that you already have at least 30 semester credit hours of university courses, which you guys should, would, um, and 12 education credits, 12, sorry, uh, semester credit hours in education classes, which you probably also have, um, and then the 3.0 cumulative GPA. And again, if you're not sure about your GPA, go on and fill out the application form and then we send out letters of, oh, you know, we're inviting you to join or at the point you don't have it but you're welcome to um, reapply. So if you have any information, um, you can t contact myself and it's just, or Dr. Cole, and it's just our last name, first initial at USD. We also have BESO. Do we have some members of BESO that would like to address the group this morning? Thank you. Come on up. Try <laughs> I'm going to show some spirit here. <laughs> we also have Cindy. I think I saw her somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Come here, Cindy. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome um, for the PD1s. I know you're excited. We're all PD2, so we know how is that. Um, <laughs> Well, basically, BESO is the bilingual education and students organization. And our main goal, we have two main goals. One is serve the community and make, the commu uh, make impact in the community. And also um, support each other um, because we know how it is, like, it's hard for us to be studying and for the test, the required test. So we do offer also uh, reviews and um, they're free. So that's good for everyone. There are people that charge maybe $40, $40 or $30 for each review, so we make them free. And also, um, our sponsor is Dr. Mitchell, and Dr. Paul is here. Um, he's also an advisor for us. And, um, well, I'm Stephanie Garza. I'm the president. This is... I'm Cynthia, and I'm the secretary. And this is... Cindy, I'm the treasurer. So we're here to help you. Um, the main requirements for our, our organization is just to attend to two events and two meetings um, the whole semester, throughout, throughout the semester. And we are gonna have the first meeting on January the 26th, that's at 12th, um, and then January the 27th at 4.30. And then some of the events we're gonna do, it's um, February the 1st, we have the Houston Food Bank and we are working also with children and we do different community service. So we're gonna be around just in case you want more information and we have applications with us today also. Thank you. Our final organization that we'd like to hear from this morning is Be a Teacher Club. So I'd like to invite those representatives up now to address you. Treasurer for Be a Teacher Club. Hi, my name is Michelle Gutierrez, and I am your secretary. And I'm Lauren Thomas. I'm vice president. And I'm Jacob Serta, and I am the president of Be a Teacher Club. And we're from Be a Teacher. Club. <laughs> <laughs> 
Our mission here at VA Teacher Club is to basically provide support to our members and even non-members, um, both personally and developly, develop and professionally, sorry. <laughs> Um, we are kind of like a little family, anything that any one of us needs as far as schooling, help studying, we're here for each other, we support each other. Um, each and every one of us really does know our members on a personal level as well as professionally and um, we just really we just really support each other with school and our future careers in education. Our first two meetings will be held here also at C100, and it will be held Thursday the 22nd at 5.30 and Monday the 26th at 5.30. And in those meetings, we'll kind of go more into depth about our organization, uh, what we have to offer, and some of the events that we have coming up this, this month. Um, in order to join, our membership fee is $6 a semester or $10 for the year and it's not due until the 15th. We also provide a professional affiliation, which is basically like an insurance um, to help us when we are in the schools. It's free. Um, it just benefits us when we're in the schools just to take care of us if you know something happens. Um, it's there to help us. We also have a special interest category, which is basically, uh, since Be A Teacher is not on a specific content level, content, um, we are, we, we have bilingual events, we have literacy events, we also have math and science. We require a special interest, which is basically, um, basically signing up for a, a, like your specific content area. Like if you're in early childhood, you can, you can um, sign up to be a HACI member. But we'll go over that also in our first meeting. Um, our advisor is Dr. Beebe, which I think he left. But he was yeah. here. He was here. Um, and then Jacob and Michelle uh, and Lauren have already introduced themselves. And we are missing Nayeli, and she's our historian. Our goals here for Be a Teacher Club is to prepare us for the future. Um, we all are here for the same thing, which is to be teachers. And we're just here to support each other and prepare us for that. We do a lot of networking and socializing. A lot of things that will help us in our future career and becoming a teacher. So we'll be here um, with our membership forms if anybody is interested in joining. If you can't and you want to join, you can just grab one of us or you can go on the fourth floor and we have our bulletin board there with our membership. Thank you. to all of our student organizations that were represented here this morning. I know you can look forward to meeting with them after the session. Dr. Medron. Yes, I'm going to put my two cents worth because I say this a lot to teacher candidates through my work, and that is when you become a classroom teacher where you sign your contract, get all that money. <laughs> One of the things that we want, and I really applaud all these organizations, is that as a classroom teacher, you need, the focus of your work is teaching, but then you also provide service. And in becoming involved right here during your teacher prep program, you are already becoming, uh, finding a way of including that as part of your professional development. And so that is very, very good, because the other aspect that these organizations really help you with is that as a classroom teacher, you have to continue your research, your professional development. And what better way for you to start cultivating that aspect of your life uh, so that when you do become the certified teacher, the teacher of record, you already are accustomed to volunteering for committees, to being a spoke person for that school, and to be an advocate for your students. So I really applaud and I really recommend that you join one of the uh, student associations or teacher candidate uh, organizations because it really does help you cultivate their uh, 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 professional connections with your colleagues. So um, I, I'm just so proud of you all with all these organizations that I continue seeing every single year uh, added to our teacher prep program. Well, this concludes our general session. So.
what we've recognized together in this first hour together are some of the general expectations for our program, both academically and professionally. We've taken a look at how we're going to prepare for our Texas exams through our diagnostic experiences. We've recognized um, some opportunities for loan forgiveness, and we've had the great fortune of hearing from our student organizations. What we're going to do now is to move to other classroom areas, and you'll have a chance to meet with your field experience instructor. As you meet with these wonderful ladies, they're going to ask you to complete some documents that we need completed at the beginning of the semester, and they're also then going to ask you and talk to you about their expectations for the semester. So let me share with you uh, a little bit about what's going to go on in that session. When you get to the session, make sure you sign in there also. They're going to ask you to sign what's called a PD signature page. That's going to acknowledge the points that we talked about this morning. They're going to ask you to fill out a Texas registration request to prepare for your exam that you'll be taking at the end of the semester. They're going to allow you to sign something called the authorization to release student information. This allows your faculty members to view your scores after you take the test so we know how to better support you. They're also going to talk to you about your background checks. Some of them are going to ask you to fill out an online background check this week, and others are going to ask you to fill out a paper copy with, with them right then. Also, if you're a para and you have applied to use your para status for your observation, check in with your FBI after the session to make sure that everything looks like it's in place. I also would like to say, if those of you that are going to be working in all Dean ISD this semester, if you did not bring a paper copy of your Texas driver's license that's required for your background check for Aldean, I'd like for you to meet me on the fourth floor across from the Urban Ed office. Uh, there's a copy machine there. We're going to do that right now. If you need a copy, you can come with me and we'll make that copy before you go see your FBI. So, uh, we have five different FBI's that will be here this morning. If you're with Ms. Ekstrom, you're going to stay here in C100. Uh, if you're with Ms. Jefferson, she's in C229. Ms. Mattern is in C225. Ms. Askew is in C224. Ms. Chermoyer is not here this morning, so you'll meet with me instead in room C226. Dr. Bonner. Yes. Oh, thank you, Ms. Chermoyer. I can see you come in. Ms. Chermoyer is here, and you'll be meeting with her in C226. So, ladies and gentlemen, before we dismiss, Let's take about 10 to 15 minutes for a break, then promptly meet with your FBI. Uh, if you need an Aldi back, uh, background check, driver's license scan, meet me on the fourth floor and we'll do that now. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to see all of you here this week.